Hello and good day. I welcome you all to the Asian Impact Webinar, a series that showcases ADB's research and informs debate on critical policy issues in Asia and the Pacific. My name is Madhavi Pandit and I am your moderator. Today's webinar marks the launch of the Asian Development Outlook 2021 update. As many of you may know, the ADO is a flagship publication that is released twice a year with an initial issue in April and an update in September. In here, you will find the latest economic developments and updates to projections and analysis, as well as a discussion of risks to growth in the region. Each issue also has a theme chapter on a timely development topic. For example, the latest issue focuses on agriculture in Asia, and I encourage you all to explore the report. But today's webinar will highlight the macroeconomic outlook and risks in the region. Join me in welcoming Abdul Abiyad, Director of the Macroeconomics Research Division of the Asian Development Bank, to present the key messages from ADO 2021 update. Welcome, Abdul. Thanks very much, Madhavi. So let me begin by uh, giving a, an overview of the key messages of part one of the Asian Development Outlook. This is the part that focuses on the regional outlook and risks, as Madhavi said. Um, thank you. Next slide, please. So um, let me start with those key messages. First, developing Asia continues to grapple with COVID-19 amid renewed outbreaks and unequal vaccination progress. Second, recovery paths are diverging in the region. Successful vaccination and containment strategies are boosting the recovery in some economies as they can take advantage of the broad recovery in global demand. But in other economies, growth is held back by rising infections and slow vac vaccination progress. Third, developing Asia's GDP growth is forecast at 7.1% in 2021. That's down slightly from the 7.3% we had in April and at 5.4% in 2022. Despite the recent pickup, inflation will remain moderate at 2.2% 2 .2 in 2021 and 2.7% 2 in 2022. Fourth, the main risks are still associated with COVID-19, including the emergence of new variants, the waning effectiveness of vaccines, and slow progress on vaccination. As, Mad as Madavi mentioned, we have a theme chapter, Transforming uh, Asia Agriculture in Asia, and we will cover that in uh, an Asian Impact webinar in early November. Next slide, please. So let's begin by taking a closer look at these, uh, at these issues I mentioned. Let's begin by looking at where Asia stands in the pandemic. New and more infectious variants are driving COVID-19 waves of outbreaks across developing Asia. New COVID-19 cases in developing Asia, which are shown in the black uh, line on the left chart, peaked at 105 cases per million in May, declined to 25 in June, and then rose again to 43 cases per million in July. While the wave in May was concentrated in South Asia, that's a purple line, the most recent waves have been in Central Asia, the blue line, Southeast Asia, the brown line, and the Pacific, that's a green line. The right chart shows that vaccination progress still varies considerably within the region. Vaccinations have progressed well in the People's Republic of China and some smaller economies. Those are the bars at the top. But, a large, but the share of fully vaccinated individuals is less than 30% in two thirds of the region's economies, largely due to supply side constraints. For the region as a whole, 28% of developing Asia's population has been fully vaccinated. And that's well below the 52% uh, vaccination rate we have in the US and 58% in Europe. Next slide, please. The slow and uneven progress on vaccination is unfortunate because vaccines are changing the nature of the pandemic by making COVID-19 a less deadly disease. So while vaccines do not stop virus transmission entirely, they're highly protective against severe cases of COVID-19. What this chart shows is the case fatality rate on the x-axis. Uh, and it shows that it declines significantly as the share of fully vaccinated people increases. And that's shown in the, on the x-axis. Vaccinations are also changing the way the governments respond to new outbreaks. When COVID-19 cases rise, 
policymakers typically tighten restrictions on mobility and economic activity. But analysis in our report shows that new restrictions tend to be milder in economies with higher vaccination rates. Next slide, please. Vaccinations and outbreaks are just two factors that have been shaping a developing Asia's recovery in the first half of this year. All 10 major economies shown here recorded positive year-on-year -year growth in the first half of 2021. Those are the yellow dots. And that growth was higher than in the second half of 2020, which is shown by the white dots. Part of this was due to the fact that the first half of this year was being compared to a very bad first half of 2020, which helps explain, for example, India's strong growth reading, uh, which you can see in the second bar there. But pandemic control also played an important role. Recovery was relatively strong in economies like the PRC, Hong Kong, China, and Singapore, where governments successfully contained virus outbreaks and quickly rolled out vaccines. In other economies where the vaccine rollouts were slower and major outbreaks occurred, such as Indonesia, Thailand, and the Philippines, growth was more subdued. Next slide, please. In recent months, renewed virus outbreaks and ongoing supply side disruptions across the region resulted in slowing economic activity. The left table shows that the purchasing manager indices or PMIs in many economies have fallen below 50, the threshold that separates improving from deteriorating economic activity. The main factors behind this are the virus outbreaks that led many economies to impose restrictions, plus ongoing supply chain disruptions. The chart on the right compares economies globally. And while we can't infer causality from this plot, we see a clear positive correlation. Manufacturing activity as measured by PMIs tends to be better in economies with higher vaccination rates. Next slide, please. Turning to inflation, the left chart here shows that inflation has risen since the beginning of 2021 after the decline that you see in 2020. Despite this increase, inflation remains manageable in most economies in the region. For developing Asia as a whole, the black dashed line shows that headline inflation has edged up from 0.8% in January to 2.3% in June of this year. Inflation has risen in each of the subregions, but inflation rates remain relatively low in East and Southeast Asia, which are the red and blue lines, compared to South and Central Asia, which are the green and purple lines. One contributing factor to rising inflation is the increase in global food and energy prices, which can be seen on the right chart. Energy prices have risen from the lows that were reached in 2020, and global food prices are now at multi-year highs. But as we show in the report, global commodity prices are not the primary driver of price inflation in Asia, as regional and domestic factors tend to dominate. Next slide, please. Developing Asia's recovery is being supported by the recovery in external demand, which is broadening across economies and across sectors. In the early phase of the recovery, the PRC's exports outperformed, and that's what you can see in the red line on the left, as, it's got, as it got its outbreak under control early, allowing it to manufacture and export while others were still in lockdown. But exports of other developing Asian economies rebounded strongly this year, that's a green line on the left, and they are catching up to the PRC. And overall, the region's exports are performing better than global exports, which are the black line on the left chart. You can also see this broadening of demand across a wider range of products. In the chart on the right, uh, what you see is a, that first, the rise in external demand was for pandemic-related goods. Uh, as those are the blue, light blue bars in this chart. And then uh, they eventually moved to electronics, the dark blue bars. This year, demand for other products, such as mechanical machinery and vehicles, shown in the brown bars, and textiles and footwear, the green bars, have also contributed to the external rebound. Next slide, please. Remittances to the region continue to be resilient. For developing Asia as a whole, remittances were up 15% in the first quarter of this year, but performance does vary across economies. The left chart shows changes in remittances last year on the x-axis and the changes in the first quarter of this year on the y-axis. Most bubbles are above the, uh, the x-axis, indicating remittance growth this year, 
A few economies saw strong remittance growth last year and continued improvement this year. And those include economies like Bangladesh and Pakistan shown in the, with the green bubbles. The size of the bubbles, by the way, uh, denote the uh, remittances to GDP. So how important remittances are to each economy. Other economies such as Armenia and Georgia saw remittances decline last year, but recover this year. Those are the blue bubbles. And a few economies are seeing further declines this year, which are those yellow bubbles. In contrast to relatively re resilient remittances, tourism remains in the doldrums. The right chart shows tourism arrivals, international tourism arrivals, still down 90 to 100% in most economies, although it has rebounded in Georgia and the Maldives, which are the red and blue lines in the right chart. These economies have adopted policies to attract tourists despite the pandemic. They also opened up earlier um, in the second half of last year, and they host many tourists from Europe where vaccination progress has been good. Next slide, please. Fiscal policy in the region remains accommodative this year with consolidation expected to occur in 2022. As shown in this chart, changes in the fiscal balance as a percent of GDP were largely negative in 2020, those as indicated by the blue bars, owing to increased spending to support the economy and falling revenues due to the pandemic. Fiscal balances are expected not to change too much this year in several economies. If you see in the chart, majority of the orange bars are slightly negative or positive. This means that many economies will avoid substantial withdrawal of fiscal support this year in a still uncertain landscape. The exceptions are the four economies that had the, large, the largest fiscal impulses in 2020, Hong Kong, China, Mongolia, Brunei Darussalam, and Singapore, where fiscal, balance will start, fiscal balances will start returning to more normal levels already this year. A general shift to fiscal consolidation is forecast starting in 2022, as shown by the green bars, which are positive for all economies. Next slide, please. Similarly, monetary policy stances in developing Asia remain largely expansionary. Major central banks in the region cut policy rates from March to July 2020 in response to the initial impact of COVID-19. And you can see that in the left-hand side chart. Since then, most monetary authorities have not loosened further, but neither have they reversed course and tightened. As a result, the monetary stance remains accommodative. As shown in the right-hand side chart, real interest rates obtained by adjusting nominal rates for either current, current headline inflation, the blue bars, or for forecast inflation, which are the yellow dots, uh, are generally low everywhere and are close to or below zero in many economies. Next slide, please. With substantial monetary and fiscal support in place, regional financial conditions remain stable. One can see this in Asian equity markets on the left chart, which have remained stable or have risen further this year. It's also evident in risk premiums in the region. As shown in the chart on the right, regional bond spreads relative to US yields have remained relatively stable since the second half of 2020. Next slide, please. So the growth outlook for developing Asia remains positive, but with a slight downward adjustment due to continued COVID-19 outbreaks. Regional GDP growth is forecast at 7.1% this year, marginally, marginally revised down from 7.3% in April, and growth is expected to moderate to 5.4% in 2022. But recovery paths differ across the region. Projections have been upgraded for East Asia, which has avoided large outbreaks and made better progress on vaccinations, and also in Central Asia, which is benefiting from higher commodity prices. But these are more than offset by downgraded forecasts for Southeast Asia, South Asia, and the Pacific, as key economies in these subregions struggle with domestic outbreaks and slower vaccination rollouts. Next slide, please. These divergences in growth paths are reflected in where GDP levels will be in 2022 relative to pre-COVID trends. For developing Asia as a whole, GDP next year will be 2.5% below the pre-COVID trend, but the gap varies substantially across subregions. East Asia avoided contraction last year and with its strong performance this year, GDP in that subregion will be close to pre-COVID trend, about just 0.7% below 
Um, gaps are wider elsewhere in the region. Southeast Asia has the largest gap at 8.6% as large GDP contractions last year are compounded by a recovery this year that's still held back by COVID outbreaks. A similar story holds for the other subregions to varying degrees. Next slide, please. Even with our modest growth forecasts, risks to the region's outlook remain tilted to the downside. COVID-19 remains the biggest risk. Continuing outbreaks may be driven by new vi various virus variants, slower than expected vaccine rollouts, or the waning effectiveness of vaccines. And this could hamper economic recovery as we've already seen this year. At the same time, policies must pay heed to other risks. Geopolitical tensions remain elevated. Global supply chain disruptions could hinder recovery in manufacturing. And normalizing monetary policy in the US and other advanced economies, which is uh, coming soon, could affect financial markets here through capital outflows and currency depreciations for some regional economies. Taking a longer view, policymakers must refocus on the continued hazard, uh, the continued risk of hazards from, from climate change. Next slide, please. So let me just close by circling back to the outlook. Um, basically, we, our general feeling is that there's hope for developing Asia's recovery. You know, 7% 7, 7 growth is, is quite good. Um, successful vaccine rollouts are turning COVID-19 COVID into a less deadly disease. And this is changing the nature of the pandemic. Where vaccination, vaccinations have progressed most rapidly, a greater degree of normalcy in people's lives can return along with a pickup in economic activity. Although there's a risk of resurgent waves from new variants, government policies must go beyond containment and vaccinations in the months ahead. Support for businesses and households need to continue. And uh, we also need to plan for the new normal once the pandemic subsides. So let me end here. And I'm looking forward to the discussion and getting questions from the audience. Thank you, Abdul, for a very comprehensive view of economic conditions in these challenging and rapidly evolving times. I'm sure our audience here will have a lot of questions on the outlook and risks. And to answer them, we are joined today by Matteo Lanzafame, Senior Economist, Macroeconomics Research Division, and Dulce Zara, regional, uh, Senior Regional Cooperation Officer, Southeast Asia Department, in a panel discussion. Um, I have a message for the audience. You can post your questions in the Q&A box and also press like for questions that you want to hear mo more about, and I can raise them with our panelists. We also welcome our LinkedIn audience to leave questions and comments in the comments section of the LinkedIn page. Okay, let me get started with a question for Matteo. It's a simple question to ask, but maybe difficult to answer. How long do you expect the effects of the pandemic to last? It's certainly a difficult question to, to answer. Um, the reason is that this is essentially a once in a lifetime crisis. So the expectation is that the, the effects are going to be uh, felt for a number of years. Um, we still don't know how long of that's, that's going to be, and that's going to depend on a number of factors. So what we see is that economies which are able to um, contain outbreaks um, also see a return to uh, economic activity or more normal economic activity rather quickly. Um, and we expect this process or this pattern to be even you know, stronger as vaccinations uh, uh, in the region continue to, to proceed. <clears throat> So um, containment strategies are really uh, important from, uh, from this point of view. Um, on the other hand, uh, there is a worry, there is a serious uh, concern uh, that the pandemic could leave um, long-term scarring uh, on, on the economy. And there are several channels by which this, this can happen. Um, for example, one of these channels we already highlighted uh, in, in our report back in April is um, learning losses which are due to uh, school closures. Uh, during uh, the pandemic. Um, another channel is the increase in, uh, in the number of people who fell in uh, poverty uh, during the pandemic. So both of these are factors which are probably going to leave uh, some persistence effects on, uh, on the economy and on people in general. But also um, mechanisms and factors which are working via the labor market. So there has been a, a significant increase in unemployment, 
and uh, long-term unemployment could be persistent or, or even permanent for, for a share of the workers. And at the same time, other workers could become discouraged and, uh, and drop out of the labor force. So overall, how long the effects are going to last uh, is going to depend on, uh, on a combination of these factors, I would say. Thank you, Matteo. We'll come back to some of those impacts, but let me just bring uh, Dulce in to ask her a question on Southeast Asia. Dulce, in the presentation, Abdul showed that ADB has downgraded growth in Southeast Asia. Please give us your thoughts on which economies have been hardest hit by recent outbreaks and what are the prospects for recovery? Thank you, Madhavi. Yes, um, indeed. Uh, Recovery is underway in Southeast Asia. Unfortunately, with, with the outbreak, with the spread of new variants, particularly Delta variant, it is slowing down the recovery in most economies. Now, um, if you talk about which countries are hardly hit, um, you know, uh, in terms of number of cases, we can say that Malaysia has the highest um, cases, and uh, as well as um, uh, Brunei, in the Vietnam as well. But then, you know, what's important is that the, the trend is going down. And it, this is because the, the governments are ramping up efforts to roll out their vaccination programs. One in interesting story is for Vietnam, you know, which was a, a stellar performer in 2020. But then now we see it uh, suffering. Um, it, it's hardly, it's hit, hardly hit by the, by the Delta variant. So um, last year, it was able to su succeed in containing the virus, mainly because of their experience from SARS. But now, given the fast transmission of the variant, um, it, it, we're seeing that it's, it's, a, it's really affecting many of its manufacturing companies. So the areas where you know, the manufacturing firms are, like in Ho Chi Minh, in Hanoi, in, in Bingzhou, and all the other ec economic zones, they're hardly hit. So factories have shut down. And this is really a, a big a blow to the manufacturing sector. So now we see the Vietnam's growth um, going down, I mean, revised downwards. It's the same for Malaysia because um, we, as I mentioned earlier, the cases have gone up and the manufacturing sector is also suffering from the closures or the, the, the temporary restrictions to mobility. So we see the supply chain disruptions happening everywhere. And that's mainly the reason why, you know, if um, if uh, the variant has been controlled, I mean, the spread, then we can see um, slowly the economy is opening up. Thank you. Madhavi, can I just add, it's very, uh, it's very interesting, those two, two of the last two examples that uh, Dulce talked about, Vietnam and Malaysia. So if you look at vaccination rates in those two countries, so Vietnam's interesting, they did very well with, uh, outbreak containment in 2020, you know, by um, things like testing, tracing, isolation. Um, but in terms of vaccination, they've been quite slow. Six uh, percent, only six percent of the seven percent of the population is fully vaccinated at this stage. So they're ones, they're ones, one one of the ones at the bottom end of that chart I showed earlier. And so that, and so obviously with this more infectious Delta variant, um, even with the controls they had in in the past, they haven't been able to avoid a domestic outbreak. In the case of Malaysia, if you look at the numbers, we were puzzled by this when we were doing the report because in Malaysia's case, uh, vaccination rates are above 40%. So more than 40% of the population is fully vaccinated and yet they were struggling. And I, so when we took a closer look, what happened was that um, Malaysia, Malaysia's vaccination drive accelerated uh, in late July, but that was too late to stop the Delta driven wave that started earlier that month. So despite making good progress, they still weren't able to beat it. And they did have a domestic outbreak that led to a lot of controls with, factory, with res factories being restricted to like 60% output and things like that. So again, I guess the point is that vaccinations, they're great, but uh, it's, really, this is a, it's really a difficult situation when you have something as infectious as, as the Delta variant. Yeah, if, if I may add, you know, in terms of vaccination, smaller population, I mean, countries with smaller population are succeeding in terms of reaching the, the targeted population, um, uh, let's say 80% of the targeted population. So that includes Malaysia, Cambodia, Singapore, of course, and Brunei. But then when, when we look at um, Vietnam, 
Philippines, Indonesia, they're lagging behind. So they only have less than 30% of the population vaccinated. That includes both um, fully and partially vaccinated. So that's the reason why the, the growth is really slowing down in those economies. Indeed, it's very interesting how there is so much variation within Southeast Asia. Let me turn to another topic that is on everybody's mind. Uh, that's regarding fiscal and debt situation. So one is that, um, maybe Abdul, you can start with this. With elevated fiscal deficits and still, still fragile econo economic recovery in the region, is there sufficient space for stimulus spending with debt sustainability risk not becoming a major concern? And secondly, um, what should be the exit strategy? When should governments start either cutting spending or raising taxes to bring debt down? Sure, thanks very much, Madhavi. Um, so it's true, public debts have risen. Uh, well, that's, that's a reflection of the uh, increase in fiscal deficits we saw in, in the <coughs> slide I showed earlier. Um, so public debt has risen in almost all economies in the region. Uh, last year. Um, and yeah, so there's been a lot of talk, how worried should we be? Uh, should, should countries start consolidating? So one point uh, we make in the report, and we show this, is that despite the increase in, uh, in public debt to GDP levels, for most economies, uh, public debt remains below 60% of GDP. That's a frequent rule of thumb used by uh, uh, by economists to, you know, to let you know whether, you know, whether you should start worrying or not. Um, so, and, and that largely reflects the fact that many developing Asian economies were relatively prudent uh, with their public finances in the years prior to the pandemic. So they were able to use that space to respond to the pandemic. And should countries start consolidating this year? Not really. I, I, as, as hopefully you've taken away from the discussion so far, it's still a very fragile recovery. And most of our economies still need continued support, both from on the fiscal side and on the monetary side. Uh, one of the lessons uh, that we can learn from the, the global financial crisis, for example, were, is, is the dangers of premature fiscal consolidation. So, uh, you know, you can sort of derail a recovery by, by uh, uh, by starting to consolidate too early. So you really need to wait until the recovery is well entrenched before you start doing that. So I can see from the question posted in the Q&A, uh, you know, for the Philippines, authorities are now looking at consolidation in, 2020, 20, in 2022 to 2023. That, that sounds about right. And as you saw in the chart I showed, that's sort of the timetable that uh, other economies are looking at as well. Thank you. Since you mentioned the Philippines, maybe I can ask the uh, question that's here again on everybody's mind. How do the upcoming Philippines elections in 2022 affect the country's outlook? Abdul? Oh, uh, you, want to, you want to toss it to me? Yeah, okay. I'm happy oh, okay. To Would Dulce like to take it? Also, where, do you want to take it first or I'm happy to take it too, whichever? Sure, Abdul. Okay. Um, we. Uh... We considered it in our outlook, but um, we, we don't see a major impact on the outlook simply because the economy is on its track recovery path. And, um, we, and it, it's, it is seen to be ramping up next, next year with the investments in infrastructure. So. Right. Yep, so I mean, uh, I, I think if you look at the, the outlook for the Philippines or our projections for the Philippines, they're driven by, as Dulce said, um, continued fiscal support, including uh, continued infrastructure spending. The other thing we, is that, um, uh, again, for many of these economies, even though progress on vaccination has been slow, it's still progressing. And so by next year, um, uh, we, you know, that, that, that will definitely help. The other thing is here in the Philippines, which is where ADB is headquartered, um, they've made good progress in terms of vaccinate, vaccinations in the national capital region. And this the NCR, as it's called, accounts for about 40% of GDP. And so uh, the hope is that activity will be able to uh, slowly open up and renormalize here, and that'll, that'll provide a boost to, um, to GDP growth in the Philippines. Thank you. Um, there are some questions here on the impact of COVID on the people. So the ADO update 
has a section which shows that an additional 291 million people will experience hunger this year, which is 72% uh, in, uh, of which 72% um, are in developing Asia. So what can be done about this? Matteo, would you like to take this? Okay, sorry. Um, yes, so, so the impact of the pandemic um, and the economic crisis obviously has been very um, uneven, not only across uh, you know, economies in the region, but also uh, across different groups within uh, uh, society and within the economies. In um, very recent estimates also from uh, ADP have shown that the number of people who fell uh, uh, in poverty has increased. And compared to a scenario in which uh, there the, the was no COVID, um, I think 75 to um, around 75 more million people, 75 million people more um, are, are below the poverty line. So that's obviously a very uh, strong impact. From the point of view of policy, uh, this is one of the things that maybe Abdul was mentioning before as well, is that fiscal uh, policy in particular uh, needs to remain accommodative and needs to continue supporting the economy, but not, not only the economy in general, but the most vulnerable groups, so the poor households, the poor um, <clears throat> struggling at the moment. And uh, the hope is that the recovery is going to lift uh, up incomes and is going to provide uh, uh, an increasing number of jobs to people, to people who lost their jobs, and so increase um, disposable income for, for people who are uh, at the moment uh, struggling. Thank you. Um, maybe we can move a little bit to monetary policy, um, and I would like to get your insights on uh, what should um, the central banks be doing at this time? <clears throat> I would say that, um, again, it's something that uh, Doug was already starting to discuss. Um, so from the presentation, we've seen that monetary policy remains essentially broadly expansionary across um, the regional economies. Um, so we saw last year, obviously, a um, significant number of uh, policy rate cuts. And this year, essentially, most central banks have stayed their hands. So no hikes uh, except for uh, two or three different uh, um, economies where you have particular uh, monetary conditions and inflationary pressures. Um, that's the right policy stance, policy stance at the moment, again, because we, we are in a very uncertain environment and we are in a situation in which the recovery is not, is not on sound uh, feet yet, it's still uh, fragile. Um, in terms of um, you know, possible worries or concerns uh, uh, regarding inflationary pressures, because this is something that uh, um, can come up and maybe discuss when you have such a, you know, uh, expansionary monetary policy. We really don't see any reason to be uh, overly worried at the moment. So we don't see any significant inflationary pressures uh, uh, in the region as a whole. There are some uh, um, countries or economies in, uh, in Central Asia where inflation rates uh, uh, either core inflation or headline inflation are already uh, above inflation uh, rates for, for the central banks. For, but for most of the regions, we see that inflation rates are still uh, very close to the inflation target or within uh, the inflation target band. So based on this evidence at the moment, there is no, you know, again, uh, strong reason to be worried about inflationary pressures building. And so monetary policy can remain and should remain a commodity until the recovery is, uh, is well entrenched. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, there are some questions that I think want to seek elaboration on the baseline assumptions on the pandemic for growth projections. Um, Abdul, maybe you can weigh in on that. Sure. Um, the, the main assumptions are that vaccination progress will continue uh, as, as, it, as it has, um, and that uh, that will uh, that will help countries avoid having to impose uh, large-scale lockdowns. Uh, so those, that is still a possibility and that's why we put it as a risk, uh, right? So it's possible that even with continued rollout of vaccines, either, either the progress on vaccines is slower uh, or those vac uh, vaccines become uh, less effective or there are new variants that, um, uh, you know, that are more, infec more infectious or that uh, prove um, I don't know, uh, more resistant to, to vaccinations. So, but yeah, so the baseline is continued vaccination, uh, no serious outbreaks. And for those that 
currently have outbreaks that they'll they'll be able to get them under control. What was the question just about assumptions on uh, on the pandemic and vaccines, or was it on other stuff? Just the pandemic. Yeah. Um, this is another issue that I think many countries in our region are worrying about, which is the prospects for tourism sector in the region. Maybe I will start with Dulce, who can give a perspective for Southeast Asia. Okay, yes, um, many of the economies in Southeast Asia are dependent on tourism. And clearly, this is one of the main reasons why, you know, growth is uh, not really picking up. Now, um, you know, compared to 2019, where there were many there were 144 million international tourist arrivals. We see you know, at this point 99, 90 to 99% below that level. So you can see that the many of the, the businesses are related to tourism are suffering. But then, you know, services in general, we still have the retail and trade, and they're slowly picking up financial services and also um, digital services, BPO in the case of the Philippines. So those are um, contributing to the growth as well. But for us, for, um, you know, outlook for tourism, we don't see them really picking up this year, although some of the countries like um, Vietnam, Indonesia, and, Bang and Thailand, they're starting to roll out some programs in order to invite um, like at least fully vaccinated tourists to come over and, uh, um, and spend, you know, uh, the needed break, so to speak. And, but we don't see them really picking up this year. So hopefully with the, uh, with the rollout of vaccination in most of these key cities, because the important is that the key cities are, you know, um, are really uh, um, ramping up and uh, rolling out the vaccination, provided the, 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 there is no shortage of vaccines, of course. So for next year, it, it may pick up a bit for domestic tourism, but we see international tourism picking up probably in 2023 and beyond. Thank you. Madhavi, can I add some uh, just on tourism more generally? Um, so we, we've, we've looked at this uh, in, uh, within the ADB, um, uh, at this issue, because it is critical to many of our economies. Uh, so one is, uh, you know, uh, Dulce mentioned domestic tourism. So in some cases, um, it's possible for domestic tourism to uh, at least you know, to substitute. You know, if people can't go out, maybe they'll travel within the country and that can help um, uh, mitigate the impact of the loss in international uh, tourism. Obviously, the size of the domestic market differs a lot. For very small Pacific economies, there's not much domestic, you know, domestic tourism is dwarfed by international tourism. But for an economy like Vietnam, for example, we saw last year uh, domestic tourism, and this was because it, it, the COVID, domestically, COVID was still under control, and domestic tourism actually really helped a lot. So that's one, right? So that's one channel uh, that can help some relative the, the larger economies, whether domestic tourism can uh, help offset. And there's a, an ADB policy brief on that that was put out uh, earlier this year or late last year. Another thing that's been considered uh, is uh, tourism bubbles. And uh, several Pacific economies explored that with Australia and New Zealand. There's, uh, and I think uh, within East Asia as well, and uh, in parts of Southeast Asia. So various uh, groups have explored, uh, country groups have explored the possibility of uh, these tourism bubbles. They're very tricky because you need both parties to get uh, COVID-19 under control. And it, that's always been, you've had outbreaks in one country or another, and it's, it hasn't, they haven't been able to really smoothly implement that. So uh, good, I think in theory, in practice, it really hasn't worked out. Although hopefully with vaccinations, that'll help. The third point I wanted to make is, again, it depends a lot on where your main tourism markets are. And if those main tourism markets uh, get to the stage where uh, they are, there's widespread vaccination, then that bodes well for you, obviously. Um, the reason I say that is because there's also a lot of pent up demand. I mean, all of us have been cooped up in, in our, in our houses want to get out. And it's the same for many people. They're looking to travel. Um, to what extent, they, again, so a lot will first travel domestically and then short haul before they start thinking about you know, long haul international travel. But there is that pent up demand. And as soon as you know, uh, vaccination uh, becomes more widespread, um, I think you will start seeing that uh, pent up demand showing. And, uh, and that'll, be, that'll be good for our uh, tourist-dependent economies.
That's very helpful. Since you, uh, especially Dulce, mentioned vaccine supply, there is a question here that says, given that vaccine supply is limited, how should countries prioritize its distribution? Should you be focusing on the more vulnerable or should you be focusing on the economically productive to get your economy going? Also, should you uh, prioritize giving everybody their first doses or giving more people their second doses? Um, Matteo, would you like to take that? Uh, yes, um, I think maybe this is a, 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 a question more for an epidemiologist than, than an economist, but I'll, I'll try to give my best answer. Uh, so we've seen uh, several different strategies across the world, right? So in some cases, uh, the, the um, groups within the population which have been prioritized are the elderly and the most fragile. And in other cases, you've seen, uh, um, you know, for example, in Italy, where I'm from at the moment, uh, other groups within the population have also been prioritized. So, for example, teachers or professors in, in universities and so on. Um, it's a, it's really a trade-off, and it's a um, both an economic, a political, and, a, and a, um, an economic decision. I would say what we do know is that this disease is it's, it's most severe for uh, um, the elderly, for the most uh, uh, fragile. So um, things, places like, for example, the UK, uh, what they have done is uh, starting to. Um, protect the most fragile. And this has allowed reopening quicker because other people could get infected, younger people could get infected, are not going to be affected as severely as, as um, other people, or older people in particular. So that's probably one strategy that, that's worked uh, uh, better in, uh, in some cases. Um, in terms of whether to vaccinate, um, you know, giving the first dose, uh, uh, and then wait to give the second dose uh, to, to cover with the first dose a larger part of the population. This is something that, for example, in the region Taipei, China has done. And uh, it's uh, again uh, um, a question of, uh, you know, what, uh, well, uh, pondering the trade off uh, between doing this and going for two doses. What we do know, the evidence at least that we have about vaccines is that. The first dose is already uh, protective, so you have a certain level of immunity. It's going to be boosted by the second dose, but you're already protecting, uh, again, uh, the most fragile people, for example, or the older people with uh, some level of immunity. So I would say that that's um, probably the best choice at the moment. Thank you. I, I, yeah, I suspect that it'll be an entry. There will be many economists and researchers who will sort of look into this you know, a year or two from now. I guess the point is the fact that many countries are trying different strategies really reflects the fact that there, you know, it's, we, it's not like we have good historical precedent for this. Uh, and so uh, countries are trying what they think work um, and are trying to learn from each other as well. Uh, ideally, in fact, you should not have to choose. If vaccine supply was sufficient, you vaccinate everybody as quickly as you can. It's only because, they, again, of limited supply and trying to figure out who, who we need to prioritize that we have these very tricky questions. I don't envy the, the politicians who are having to make those decisions. If I may add maybe one uh, additional piece of information that may make the choice easier in terms of you know, the, the lag between the first and the second dose is that apparently delaying the second dose is actually better. It's, uh, it, it improves uh, uh, the um, immunity response. So that, that part of the problem maybe is becoming less, less important as we go uh, forward. Let Thank me you. share with you uh, what is happening in Southeast Asia. Okay. You know, as as uh, we can see, most of the, you know, the, the high cases are happening in the major cities throughout the region. And the governments, how they are approaching this is to prioritize those highly um, you know, infected cities. And uh, like, let's say in the case of um, the Philippines, so we're, um, Metro Manila, um, as Abdul has mentioned earlier, is targeting 80% of the population by next month. So now it's doing at 60%. So that has been a big improvement. So the, the restrictions are slightly um, be, being loosened up. And then in the case of uh, Vietnam, they, they um, adopted the approach of uh, uh, giving everyone a single dose. So particularly in Hanoi and Ho Chi Minh, which are, you know, they contribute about 40% of GDP. So they, they prioritize the workers. Now in Thailand, we can see that the elderly are the, um, I, I guess, the, the neglected sector. 
So what the government is doing is to go, you know, house to house and then um, just to make sure that the, that the elderly are given the shots and also for businesses to ensure that their workers are vaccinated before they come to the, to the office. So those are different approaches that we're seeing throughout the region. Thank you. I think you all did pretty well for economists and not epidemiologists. Um, let me ask this question that I know, again, is in the news. Uh, can ADB comment on rising concerns surrounding Chinese debt, particularly in China's real estate sector? And have these been incorporated into the latest GDP forecasts? Also, uh, which other countries will be affected by debt defaults in China? Abdul, maybe we can start with you. Sure, uh, happy to take that. I, I assume the um, person is asking about uh, what's happening to Evergrande, which is uh, 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 one of the largest uh, property developers in China. It's been in the news a lot, uh, especially in the last week or so. Um, so, well, to answer one of uh, your uh, questions, Madhavi, it's not in our forecast. A lot of this really happened uh, just this month, and uh, our data cut off uh, for the Asian Development Outlook was uh, August 31st. So everything that happened after in September is not incorporated in our forecasts. Um, it definitely bears careful monitoring um, for a couple of reasons. One is, uh, as I said, you know, uh, Evergrande is uh, one of the biggest participants in China's uh, property sector. And the property sector itself is very important in China's economy. Um, it, uh, housing accounts for a substantial chunk of household wealth over there. So if something happens to property, if something happens to property prices, that can affect um, uh, consumption through wealth effects. Um, three reasons why that give some reassurance that uh, we shouldn't be overly worried. First is that this isn't a surprise. I mean, the fact that uh, um, this is happening actually reflects policy actions by the Chinese authorities. So. Uh, the Chinese authorities have for several years now been aware of growing financial, growing risks uh, in, in the economy, in particular financial risks, uh, again, uh, rising debt and, and the property sector is where that debt has risen the most. So they imposed, they, they were called the three red lines, sort of uh, um, limitations on how much debt could be taken on. And um, part of Evergrande's problems is in, in trying, is in trying to um, fulfill those conditions, uh, they can't sort of keep rolling over. So, um, so, so that's one, it's, a, it's not a surprise. This is really happening precisely because uh, the, the Chinese government is trying to head off uh, risks in the sector. The second is that um, if you look at the banking sector as a whole in China, capital buffers are, um, are quite good and can absorb a shock of the size of Evergrande. Um, what they need to avoid is, uh, you know, the, the kind of liquidity freeze or liquidity squeeze in interbank markets, uh, and uh, they're addressing that. For example, the, the PBOC actually uh, injected liquidity of about fourteen billion dollars last Friday. Um, so um, that's that's the other reason that uh, um, the banking system as a whole uh, that has capital buffers uh, to absorb um, uh, any problems. The third is that, there, that the, the Chinese government has many policy levers. So uh, there's more control over what happens in the economy uh, in China than in, in other economies, right? Many of the banks are, um, uh, are state-owned uh, and many of the uh, other participants in, in, in key sectors in the economy are also state-owned. So there are many levers that they can use. So um, having said that, again, we, we really need to monitor carefully just to make sure that um, you know, things don't spread beyond Evergrande. We, we're already seeing this, right? So if you look at the high yield bonds uh, more uh, in, in the region, uh, yields have gone up, uh, equity markets uh, have fallen in response. This tends to happen. Yeah, uh, financial markets tend to react to these things. Uh, we'll see whether they stabilize. But so what we need to watch out for are, again, sort of freezing of financial markets and uh, sort of contagion to other developers or to financial markets more generally. Thank you, Abdul. Uh, 
Um, there are a few in the audience interested about uh, rising shipping costs. So the report has a chart showing international shipping costs rising eightfold from pre-pandemic levels. Why is this happening? What does it mean for global trade, economic activity in general, and also for inflation? Mateo, would you like to take this, please? Um, so we have a box actually on, uh, on uh, um, two particular sectors which are really affected by um, disruptions in, uh, in shipping and also more generally supply side disruptions. So what is happening is that you have um, essentially a mismatch between uh, increasing demand on, on the one hand as the uh, global economy is recovering from uh, last year's crisis and on the other side, you have uh, uh, supply and production, which are more rigid. So supply is, is essentially being disrupted by, by COVID-19 last year and, and still this year. And this is creating some tension between the two forces, between demand and, uh, and supply. And this is resulting in, uh, in an increase in uh, uh, shipping rates and uh, several other uh, supply side disruptions again. Uh, these are affecting particular sectors. I was mentioning before uh, uh, electronics, uh, semiconductors, and of course, you know, these effects on particular sectors are going to uh, have spillovers on uh, other parts of global value chains. So for example, uh, the automotive sector is being affected quite significantly, but also other sectors as well. Um, how long are these going to last? It's again, something that is not easy to forecast at the moment. Initially, the, the expectation was for, was for, for these disruptions to be really temporary and be over in, in the space of a few months. But now we've seen that essentially these are more persistent than initially expected. So it's going to take some time uh, for uh, uh, supply to completely adapt to, to the increase in demand. Uh, but uh, you know the, the adjustment is going to come uh, forward um, in the next uh, uh, few months. Um, is, at least this is the current expectation. And finally, with respect to the impact on, on inflation, it's a different story when you look at the impact in advanced economies and say emerging economies and especially in Asia. So the products that I was mentioning before, uh, for example, electronics or automotives and so on, uh, shipping costs are really a marginal uh, part of, of you know, the production cost for, uh, for these sectors. So we don't really expect any significant impact from this supply side disruptions on, uh, on uh, prices in, uh, in developing Asia. Thank you. Madhavi, if I can just uh, make one uh, addition to what Ma Matteo said. So yeah, just it's important to distinguish. So uh, Matteo had mentioned, right? Disruptions in shipping, that's one. Disruptions in uh, semiconductors, uh, it's another. And how quickly those resolve, they're probably different. I would suspect that uh, in shipping, uh, Matteo had mentioned that a lot of this is actually on the demand side, that demand is just getting ahead of uh, available supply. Some of it is al also on the supply side. You had closures of certain uh, ports in uh, China, um, again, COVID related. Um, but uh, the expectation would be that uh, th these shipping should resolve uh, more easily. With semiconductors, there are varying opinions, but it could be longer in part because ramping up semiconductor capacity is not very easy. It takes a while to build uh, uh, increased, um, uh, to, 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 yeah, to build you know, new factories. Uh, I think part of it, again, here as well, there's a demand side story and a supply side story. <clears throat> On the supply side, you had things like drought in Taipei, China, the cold snap in uh, Texas, uh, contributing to lower production of uh, semiconductors. On the supply side, same thing, a uh, big increase in demand because we're now using a lot more electronics for work from home, uh, remote learning, etc. And to the extent that that demand is sustained and you need to increase capacity in the semiconductor industry more generally, it'll take a while for that to build. So at least, again, we're not specialists in that sector, but uh, industry, uh, um, specialists who focus on semiconductors say it, that it'll be 2022, in some cases 2023, uh, for, for that uh, capacity to ramp up. 
Thank you, Mateo and Abdul. I want to turn the focus on um, uneven recovery again. So there is a question here that says, we hear a lot about Build Back Greener. Do you foresee ESG trends to be part of the recovery or do you see a reversal in gains in aid in the past few years? And also there is a similar question that says the participation of women in labor force, where many studies have documented that the impact has been harsher on women. So uh, in all these aspects, do you see that we go forward or do you think there's going to be some reversal? Who would like to take this question? I'm happy to, to take the ESG question if, uh, and then uh, I'll leave uh, participation of women uh, or the impact on women uh, to Mateo and Dulce. Um, so on ESG, we actually did a report on that in our April uh, uh, Asian Development Outlook report. The theme chapter was on green and social finance. And what we documented there was, again, this uh, uh, increasing trend uh, toward use of uh, green and social finance, or ESG, uh, uh, um, more generally, um, pre-pandemic. And that actually accelerated during the pandemic, right? Social finance, for example, is much more of a need to, uh, uh, to support um, or to finance uh, uh, social needs. So I would expect that to continue. There's uh, uh, both because of the pandemic, but because of other longer term trends, right? Uh, the issue of climate change will continue to grow over the coming years. So uh, if anything, I, I expect that that will continue, if not, and, and likely accelerate over the coming years. Oh. Okay, I can I can talk about um, ESG as well. Okay, for for the region, um, you know, um, we the there is a a strong case for for inviting uh, investors um, to come into the region um, by by uh, adopting ESG, uh, I guess, uh, standards, incorporating that in the in the production, and um, that's that's one uh, for for the regions to move forward. Um, so right now, you know, the, the global is awash with the liquidity, looking for bankable projects. And this is one area that the Southeast Asia, you know, the governments in the region can, can uh, start looking into and uh, developing frameworks to encourage financing towards green projects. And also for, for the women, we know that, um, and I think this has, this has been covered by ADO in previous studies uh, or previous publications that Women are mostly affected by COVID, and therefore there is also a strong case to come up with the measures to ensure that the women are, are uh, given jobs, incomes, and to, to help them become productive once again. And uh, yes, uh, that would be a crucial part of recovery. Now, uh, um, something that is not really, uh, you know, you, don't, you didn't mention it, but it's related to it, funding. Funding the, the projects for ESG, I, I know the, the governments are trying to find ways to finance um, recovery, right? And the, it is important at this point that they, they look into the domestic resource mobilization. And the, that is one critical part in order to push for green recovery to improve the, the mobilizing resources. And um, as it is right now, many of the of the governments or the countries have already hit, as what Abdul has mentioned, 60% of public debt to GDP, which is still, um, which was made possible because governments were, had had enough headroom in the past for, for the additional, for the needed funding. But then now more than ever, so efforts should be concentrated on how to expand tax bases, um, you know, taxing the wealth, property, digital services, and of course, improving tax administration and supporting international tax cooperation. I stop here. Thank you, Dulce. Unfortunately, we are at the end of the hour, so I will um, wrap up today's panel discussion. Indeed, it has been very informative, both the webinar and the panel discussion. A big thank you to Abdul, Mateo, and Dulce for navigating us through an illuminating discussion on vaccines, policies, variants, economic recovery, and many, many other issues in the Asia and Pacific region. Thanks also to you, our audience, for your active participation today. 
The Asian Development Outlook 2021 update is now available on ADB's website, www.adb.org. Finally, if you enjoyed today's event, please join us again on October 7th, Thursday at 3 p.m. Manila time for a webinar on an enhanced measure of regional cooperation and integration via Zoom. Thank you, everyone, and stay safe.